I said, I had a little wicker basket there on my nightstand. And in the wicker basket, I believe there were three, three or four earrings and maybe two women's rings. And then my friend Don had left a little, uh, little ring with a little half crescent turquoise moon in it that was sitting right next to the watch. And yet they take only the watch and that mysteriously ends up being the one thing that was Windows. You know, the, the statistical not, you know, probability of them doing that, you know, it's next to nil. So, I mean, it's just kind of peculiar that they claim that. But, you know, the t with the T-shirt, it's just, I mean, I understand that, you know, it definitely does not look good. But I just like to point out, it just doesn't make sense. And, I mean, when it comes to the hands, they searched everywhere up until my trial. You know, I had people tell me, you know, weeks before my trial, they had cadaver dogs going through all the yards between the uh, Windows apartment and mine. You know, they searched everywhere. They took fire trucks and blocked off her street and searched everywhere. They searched every sewer, storm drain, rooftop, gutter, everything between her place and mine. I said, I had no car. And they never found them, but yet I supposedly leave this stuff right here in the middle of my, you know, in plain sight, basically. And yet, supposedly, go and hide this other stuff with, you know, that's never been found. Hmm. When, when you say you went back and found her, were you intoxicated at that point? Yes. Okay. I kinda, did, it, I mean, did it ever occur yeah. to you to say, call the police right away? I mean, yeah. why, why didn't you do that? Yeah, you know, I just went through this with the clemency board, and it yeah. just, I don't think they can, you know, or few people can kind of, you know, figure that out. It's just, it's the way I was raised. You know, I was raised with, you know, I lived on the streets with bikers and meth heads. You know, I grew up on Indian reservations where you don't call the police at all. You know, the only time the police ever came to an Indian reservation was as if there was an actual murder. But you just, I was just raised, you don't call the police for anything. And I've maintained to my last breath, if there was any, uh, ever any indication that she was still alive, there's nothing in the world that would have stopped me from calling the police and calling 911. But even the paramedics said they didn't even have to go up and uh, check for signs of life. You just looked at her, you could see she was deceased. So, and when I found her, the first thing that went to my, I had two warrants out for my arrest for uh, traffic, traffic violations and failure to pay fines. And the first thing that went through my head is if I call the police, they're going to run my name, see I have warrants, arrest me, and I'm going to lose my job. I was working at the Quaker Square Hilton in Akron. It was the best job I'd had in an extremely long time. And I just, I knew I'd lose my job if I had to go spend the weekend in jail. You were a, a chef? or Yeah. That, that's the other thing they bring up is this, you had this, this uh, packet of knives. Yeah. Two or three of them were missing. Yeah. Or there at least weren't knives there. Yeah. How do you explain that? There was never any knives in there. I mean, that, that portion of it. As I say, it was a canvas, it was a rolled up canvas uh, thing to hold my um, cooking knives. And you could see in them last three slots, you know, after keeping a knife in it for a while, it stretches the canvas out. So even when you take the knife out, the impression's still there. Them last three slots had never been used. You know, there was just nothing ever there. And, you know, this goes also to their... Uh, these knives were, this knife set was kept at work. That's where I kept it. It was always kept there. You know, and that goes, that plays in a part where the state can never make up their mind. It goes to suit the argument. And one time to argue it was a pre-planned meditated murder, which according to them, I would have then had to have gone back to the Quaker Square Hilton, snuck in with nobody seeing me, taken my knives out to then go back to Winter's apartment. You know, and then when the argument suits them, it was just a fit of rage and, you know, it was just spur of the moment, no planning, no nothing. But now them knives said if anyone looks at it, I don't know how they stored them, but if anyone looks at pictures of them back then, them last three slots, there, there had never been knives kept in them. I think a dishwasher stole one. It's a little paring knife. Hmm. Caught him three times trying to steal <laughs> Before all this happened, were you a proponent of the death penalty? I Have you never, ever thought, even thought of it before no. this? No. 
I've never given it a thought. What do you think of it now? I think it's totally flawed. You know, it, it, there's so many mistakes on every single level. And it's all, it's 90, 95% politics. It has nothing to do with justice or the law or anything. You know, it's just, it's, it's almost all politics. I mean, look at the, uh, look at the recent decision by the courts. Are you familiar with the jailhouse snitch issue? Well, Brian Tyson, the jailhouse snitch can say that I confessed to him. We now have... Oh, okay, that's one where, okay. Yeah, where his attorney has basically come forward and said, after his testimony, he went and told my trial judge, look, this guy is lying his rear end off. And my judge said, I don't care. You know, the recent court, instead of letting us, and the state has maintained on multiple levels, and if you go back to the newspaper articles from back at that time, mm -hmm. you know, Sherry Bevan Walsh and them maintained that was a big part of my conviction. You know, they said they don't need to do DNA testing, they have the confession. They don't need to do this or do that, they have the confession. But, you know, the courts recently ruled that even in light of this, new evidence that he'd lied, the jury would have still chosen to believe him. I mean, how does that make sense? They're basically saying if we had put the, uh, uh, the snitch's uh, attorney on the stand to tell the jury that, you know, the snitch lied, that he, he knows for a fact the snitch, everything he said was a lie, that the jurors, jurors would have still believed the snitch. You know, that's politics. They're making, uh, you know, they're making justifications to just, you know, deny me. Mm -hmm. Instead of, again, instead of just, let's just have a hearing. You know, I'm a proponent of open discovery. Let's put everything on the table and see what happens. You know, all I, all I want is one hearing where both sides put everything we have on the table and see what happens. But I know the state would never go for that. Because I have too much stuff that they just can't uh, compensate for. Mm -hmm. If you could get the flaws out of the system, do you think the person who killed Wenda deserves the death penalty? I don't think any civilized country should have the death penalty. You know, I go with uh, you know, countries like Holland, where they have, you know, the max I think anyone can get is 25 to life. But they have, after that, they have civil, what I think, what I believe amounts to civil commitment, that, all right, after you're 25 to life, if you still pose, you know, if you haven't changed, you still pose a threat to society, then they can continue to uh, keep you incarcerated. You know, most people I know back here are, don't even resemble the people they were when they first came in. You know, I know no one will ever believe me. You know, most of the public will never believe me when I tell them I've met better people on death row than I've ever met out on the street. If I'm hungry, all I have to do is say so, and there's someone there to give me some food. If there's anything I need, you know, there'll be someone, you know, to be there to help me. Most people back here, I mean, it's not all of them, but most back here no longer resemble the people they, uh, that they were when they came in. How are you different than when you came in here? Growing up a lot. How old were you when you came on death row? 23. And you're how old now? 38. How have you grown? How have you grown up? In every way imaginable. <laughs> you know, and I've matured a lot. I've learned a lot. You know, when I was 23, life was all, you know, as most 23s, life was about me. You know, everything was me, me, me. You know, now I think I tend to think of others before I think of myself. You know, I've learned a lot. You know, I've become an ordained minister. I'm licensed by the state of Ohio to perform marriages. I've actually performed a marriage. Have you? Yeah. ODRC didn't like that. <laughs> uh, you know, and, you know, I've taught myself to paint. I don't know if you've been to my website to see my paintings or anything like that. What's your website address? Uh, www.enddeathpenaltyforbretthartman.com. Okay. It's Hartman with two N's. Is that how you spell your last name with yes. two N's? Because I've seen it both ways, but it is two N's. The resting officer put one in... Everyone's refused to change it since. 
but it's in-depth penalty for brethartman.com, and you see most of my artwork. I think I've gotten kind of decent. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I partake in, you know, every kind of uh, community service that's permitted. You know, most of it was at OSP. OSP was real big with uh, helping us with community service. Mm -hmm. You know, we, uh, I did multiple stuff for uh, local battered women's shelter there. You know, we adopted schools. I did a lot of uh, things called the University Project Learning Center. You know, I'd always, you know, I always tried to, uh, since I don't really have a church per se to go to, to give my, uh, you know, pay tithes to the church and stuff, I would usually take a percentage of what funds I get in from friends and family and buy school supplies and stuff like that for uh, the University Project Learning Center, and I'd do paintings for the classrooms and stuff like that. But you just, you know, I think it's inevitable you grow at some point as a person. I think, you know, I know before my mom passed, you know, she always said she was proud of the person that I'd grown up to be despite my situation. If 